Today's guest is a man who has seen and done it all in the world of rock and also in the world of art. I am pleased to have today at the Rock House, Kelly Garney, founding member of Quite Riot. Kelly, how are you today, man? Jock, it's so good to talk to you. We've been planning this for a while and I'm glad we're finally doing it. Mate, I am I am finally glad that we're doing it as well. We've corresponded a lot on email, mate, and I've got to say, so looking forward to this because your story is an absolute classic. Yeah, well, let's let's get right to it and have a let's good talk. To, let's let's get into it then, Kelly. What what got you into music in the first stage? Um, you know, it's it's funny. Uh, prior to meeting Randy Rhodes. Uh, about two years prior to that, I had actually rented some guitars and stuff like that from a local music store. And uh, I did, I seemed to have some sort of an interest in music. Yeah. Uh, I didn't really understand what, what the interest was. I just thought that it was kind of cool to play one of those cool looking guitar things. So my dad and mom were, they were cool enough to rent me one. Nice. And, I didn't do anything with it. I didn't take any lessons. I just made some racket with it, and, you know, and after a little while, it got rather unpopular for me to have this interest after hearing these horrible noises I was making. But but everything changed when I met Randy Rhodes. And when that happened, then I was I was like all in for the music thing because he ignited a spark in me that I didn't even know was there. Yeah, you, you talk about Randy, you and Randy Rhodes together formed the band White Riots, who yes. has had some massive success, not only in the 70s, after, uh, but the 80s. After quite a few other bands. <laughs> That's exactly right. It was a great time for music indeed. How, how did you meet Randy? Uh, I met him in school. He was an oddball kid. I was an oddball kid, and that worked. Uh, that was a great formula for two oddballs to get together and make uh, a set of balls. Yeah, that's that's good. A set of balls, mate. Randy's got big balls <laughs> with his guitar playing. So I think it oh. kind of born then and there when he was quite young. Yeah. You mentioned he sparked an interest for you with music. How did he spark that interest and develop your own passion? Well, actually, it was rather selfish of him. Although I did ask. Because everyone around us, uh, in his household, in his neighborhood, um, we were, they were all very musical. And I didn't really have any ability yet. And I said, well, I want to play something. I want to play something. And Randy was just learning how to play lead guitar from his guitar teacher. And a bass player would be very, very convenient for him to have something, you know, to bounce what he was learning out, off of. And so he convinced me to be a bass player and we got me a bass. Um, and from there, you know, it was just all about the bass for me and it was all about the guitar for him. And we just kind of learned everything um, together. He, of course, accelerated in his learning ability and certainly his dedication far more better than I did. But I was adequate, I was good enough, and uh, and we were great friends and we were having a good time. So, uh, yeah. you know, I guess it worked out pretty good for him. How did um, Kevin, Kevin DeBrow come into the mix as well at this point? Uh, I actually am the one who found Kevin. Randy and I, had been out partying for a night in Hollywood and we were spending the night at this girl's house that we knew who lived near the club that uh, we were attending that night. And I woke up before Randy early in the morning and this girl was on the phone with her girlfriend and uh, was talking about some guy that, that her girlfriend had met at a concert and he said he was a singer and he looked like Rod Stewart, kind of. And and he said he was a photographer. And, and all I heard was was the word uh, singer. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, we're always looking for a singer. Always. Uh, so who is this guy? And so I asked her. She got me his number. I called him. 
we went over and we visited him, although there's his version of this story and mine. But trust me, mine's the true one. <laughs> the other one just makes him look good. And it's I hate to say that about story. somebody that's not here to defend himself because he would argue, oh, no, 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 you remember it wrong. Um, but no, we, we went to his house and checked him out, and we just thought, uh, this is not our guy. But he would not leave us alone and um, kept calling us and wanting to do things and get together and jam and all that. And we spaced him as much as we could. And eventually he got to Randy who caved in and said, yeah, come on over. And I was like, oh, man, why did you do that? That guy sucks and he's ugly. <laughs> and so he showed up. And it went horrible. It sounded horrible. We He did bring a microphone, which we ran through a guitar amp, which is never a good idea. Right. And, um, but it, as far as I was concerned, it was, it was good enough for me to know that this guy sucked. <laughs> and, and so I said to Randy, you know, I said, well, what'd you expect? I told you. He sucks. And, um, Randy said, yeah, yeah, I know. Okay. You know, and, but Kevin was unrelentless and he just kept calling us and wanting to do stuff. And he was very ambitious. We did like that about him. We thought that was, that was pretty good. We hadn't really experienced that with somebody. Uh, Kevin wanted to be a rock star from the day he was born. And that was coming through with everything that he was saying to us about his plans and how he could make things happen and all that. He was a little bit older than us, so we kind of we kind of believed him. He said he knew people. So we just finally we gave in and he was in the band. And then we used uh, Drew Forsythe, a drummer who had been in uh, at least one or two bands with me and Randy previously. Yeah. And so that was quite great. How did you come across your first record deal? Um, so in 1978, two records were released, uh, the debut album Quite Right and the follow-up Quite Right 2, both released in 1978. How, how did you come to get the record deal? Well, it was a complicated thing, really. I mean, uh, sorry to keep rubbing my nose. I have dog hairs all over it from my dog <laughs> loving on me. <laughs> uh, for those who, who I'm uh... trying to talk here, Pandas. I mean, you know. Uh, anyways, um, we had had some experience with records prior to getting the big record deal with Japan, as big as that could be during that time. Uh, our first manager, Dennis, uh, had paid for a little uh, EP that we did that had three songs on it. And uh, now it's, if you can find one, I think they're worth a fortune. I don't even have one. Wow. Um, but um, that was our first, and, and, and our first experience with putting out a record. And we said, wow, this is great. You can hand it to somebody. You can say, hey, we have this great band, you know, and everybody says that, you know, but here's our record. Here's our record, yeah. yeah. And so that was really good. So when we left that management, we went with a different management and um, that made a real record deal a possibility. But then again, how real was it? Well, we went to, gosh, I don't even know how many, 30 to 50, 60, I don't even know how many record labels and we got turned down by everybody. Back wow. in those days, you had to have an American record deal, you had to have a European record deal, and you had to have an Asian record deal. And for all I know, you needed a South American record deal. No one ever mentioned that one. So um, so no American labels wanted to sign this. And of course, we went to all the usuals, Capital, Atlantic. Cas Casablanca came very... very uh, very close to signing us okay. uh, were Kiss's label at the time yep. and and Donna Summers was their, their big claim to fame 
And um, that was the label that we really, really wanted to be able to, because we felt Neil Bogart could sufficiently promote us. But he finally passed too. So that was that. We did finally get a deal with a company. Uh, I'll try to remember their name. Um, they were a Buddha Records, very, very small company. But hey, they gave us uh, 30 grand to uh, go in and record an album, which back then was pretty standard. And so we went in, recorded the album. Problem was, their checks bounced. Oh, no. So how, how did you cover the recording costs then at this point? <laughs> exactly. And these are all things that as a, you know, 15, 16 year old kid, I sure as hell don't want to know shit about this. Yeah. So, you know, how do we pay for that? Well, our management got a little bit desperate, went clear over to Japan, met with Sony and Sony signed us and gave us the money. So Sony and Japan gave you the money at this point. Yeah. So we got bailed out by yeah. Japan. Sorry, were you only 16 at this point at the time of the first record? Were we what? Were you only 16 at the time of this first record? Yeah, when we first started it. Wow. Yeah. Quiet wow. Riot was formed when I was 15 years old. There you go. Wow. Amazing. Not many 15 yeah. years would be signed by Sony Japan. I wouldn't have thought. Yeah. Well, I mean, the deal went down and they, they paid for everything. So um, that handled that problem. But now we had a new problem. Yes, Which we have a record deal, but um, you couldn't buy them in L.A. You couldn't buy them in New York. You couldn't buy them anywhere in the U.S., you know, unless you went to a really, really good import store. Yeah. And there, those were few and far between. So, you know, we could tell people, yes, we have an album. And they'd say, where can I get it? Japan. You just say, well, you have to go to Tokyo. Yeah. <laughs> and go to a record store in Tokyo and uh, have a nice trip and, um, you know, have some sushi while you're getting the record or whatever. <laughs> but uh, it was it was sort of a non-existent record deal for us, but it bailed us out of that problem. Yeah. Hell, how how did record the, second, the what now? How did the record perform in Japan then? It did very well. It, it did extremely well over there to where we, we got an enormous amount of Japanese press. We were in every major magazine over there. Uh, the Japanese people were always coming over here and doing photo shoots and interviews with us and bringing bags and bags and bags of gifts from the Japanese people. We loved the Japanese. We, we just thought this was great. Uh, but the big question was, so when are we going there, folks? And that never really got answered or resolved. I finally made it uh, to Japan in about 2014. Wow. Wow. And all this, all this was, was going on in 1977, 76, you know. Yeah. yeah. And it, it took me till 2014 to get to Japan. Wow. Wow. The record itself is, is a collector's dream now, if you can find us. Uh, yeah. Do you still have a number of copies yourself? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> a number of copies. That's kind of a good way to put it. Because throughout the years, people have stolen many of them from me. Oh. <laughs> and, um, you know, you go out to a bar you bring the wrong girl home and the next thing you know when she leaves you know your album's gone um or somebody else does it or something but uh i do have original copies of both um but i i have to say probably you know i understand the collectability of the originals but yeah. the re-release of them by no remorse records Yes. Uh, really did those records justice because they sound 10 times better than they did. The packaging is incredible. Yeah. Uh, all the bonus things you get are amazing. And it sounds like they give me money to say this, but uh, all they did was give me one box set. So, yeah, uh, lovely. 
I wanted more than that. And I left them a very subtle hint about that, but it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the follow-up album, Clock Ride 2, coming out also in Japan that same year. What, what was the recording? Was the recording process different? Yeah. I'd have to say it was different. Yeah. First of all, we went into a way better studio. So that was nice. Now we were in the record what, plant. Okay. What was the budget for the second album? 30,000 first? 30 Good. grand. Yep. And um, the thing that had changed was the dynamics in the band, uh, particularly between me and Kevin, yep. who had developed an intense hatred towards each other. And um, so we had a lot of tension recording that album. Sadly so. I really wish I could, you know, erase that whole thing yep. and somehow find it in my heart to love Kevin back then. But that happened many years, many, many years later, but it sure wasn't happening then. And, um, you know, it just, it wasn't an enjoyable experience for me. There, there were actual fist fights during the recording of that album between me and Kevin. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kelly, it, it did lead to your eventual departure from Quite Right. It's well documented um, in the press. In your words, the reason behind leaving Quite Right at this time? Do I what? In your words, what, what was the reason for leaving Quite Right? That tension with Kevin boiled over quite yeah. a bit? Yeah, that, that was just awful. And it, and it, you know, it went on in rehearsals and it, it was a constant thing backstage at the show, you know, um, you know, Kevin very famously went through a very, very public and very big, you know, dickhead stage. And um, I kind of got the beginnings of that. Yeah. And yeah. I was the first one to really ever have a problem with him because he had no prominence before Quiet Riot. And once he had that, you know, then things that went on between us, you know, were, you know, kept very hush hush, but, you know, people around couldn't help but notice. And yeah. sadly, you know, I wish I could undo that, but, you know, bottom line is he was a dickhead back then. And he would admit it to me fully as he actually has when he was alive. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, it's just too bad things were like that. I feel I, I don't feel bad so much for me and Kevin because we were able to mend our rift. The thing yeah. I feel bad for is mostly for Randy, who was really, really caught in the middle yeah. of all this. Drew, the drummer, not so much. Yeah. He, you know, he still had to deal with it. But but Randy was he liked Kevin and I could never figure out why until yeah. many, many years later. And then I said, oh, okay, now I see why you think this guy's cool. And, and what uh, reason? but, but actually by then he actually was cool. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he had his dickhead years behind him <laughs> and um, had learned his lesson that yeah. he needed to be nice to people. So uh, he could still be something to deal with as, Many people will attest to, you know, in his uh, last years, but not with me. No, we, we just got along beautifully. And if, if we could have had that during the band, there's no telling what Quiet Riot would have done. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, we all know where Quiet Riot ended um, and are still yeah. going well with, with Rudy Sazo just rejoining. But um, you, you did mention that you and Kevin did make amends when – when and we do, yeah, we, um, we have a mutual friend by the name of Kim McNair. Yeah. He was actually Kevin's roommate uh, when we were, uh, you know, dealing with all these record things. And Quiet Riot was a thing, and we played at the Starwood every other week and shows other other places. And Kim was uh, Kevin's roommate, so and he came from. He basically kind of grew up with me and Randy. We we met Kim when we were about 13 or 14 years old 
Yeah. And he was older than us, which we liked because he could go in to a liquor store and he could actually buy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and he had his own house, you know, whereas everybody we kind of knew, you know, uh, anybody our age, you know, they lived at home. But Kim yeah. was great. And after Randy passed, Kim decided on his own, completely on his own, uh, that uh, the hatred that Kevin and I had uh, was a total waste and that we really should get together and try and come to some mutual thing yeah. where we like each other and we appreciate our history because we, we had such a unique history together. Yeah, with definitely. Randy, you yeah. know, I mean, we had no idea that Randy was going to be the big rock god icon, you know, that he turned out to be. Yeah. Uh, we didn't know. You know, we just thought everybody thought he would be great. Yeah. But no, it, it's it gone pretty far beyond that. Definitely. Uh, rock and Roll Hall of Fame. There, That tells you something. Yeah. So. Yeah, very, very revered. Uh, he's playing as well. So Quiet Riot was playing in Las Vegas where I was living. And uh, Kim flew up here. And he announced to me that he decided that me and Kevin were now going to be friends. And I said, well, okay, I'll try that. See if it works. And he got me and, and Kevin in a hotel room. And you know what? All the hate, all the ice, all the bad times that were memories just went away. Wow. You know, there was no tension when you locked eyes together for the first time. We talked about Randy a lot. And we even talked about the reason Kim brought us back together. And we said, only we share that. So we need to be friends. And while that wasn't exactly said, that's how we felt. And we could tell that about each other. And and that's how it ended up. Yeah. Until it actually did end. And yeah. that's a sad thing. That's um that's a beautiful story. Thanks for sharing that with us, Kelly. And um I'm sure Kevin's looking down on this with a huge smile on his face hearing those words. I adore so Kevin. Yeah. Absolutely adored him. Yeah. You know, once yeah. once he was your friend, you really had somebody in your corner. He did yeah. a lot of things for me and I did some things for him, but he That's did awesome. a lot of good things for me. Nice. We'll talk about Randy for a little bit before we move on uh, to sure. other great things, but obviously you were very close with Randy as well, having been best mates at school. Well, what's your fondest memory uh, outside of Randy's absolute perseverance and determination with guitar? What's your fondest memory from that friendship? Oh, gosh, you know, there, there'd there be literally thousands. You know, we met when we were 11, or I was 11. Randy was always one year ahead of me. He was 12. And, you know, certainly the learning experience that I got in music is a very memorable thing. But other than that, it was it was the things we did outside of music that I remember the best. Um When we were pretty young, we used to ride these uh, death traps called flexi flyers, which are basically a snow sled with wheels on it. And very conveniently had a really, really awesome road that we could go down uh, on these things that was real long and real steep and real curvy. And it was dangerous and blood was spilled. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there will be blood when you go on a flexi and <laughs> memories like that are good memories of us just hustling to get by you know bumming money picking up yeah. you know returnable bottles out of alleys um all that when we were young and then yeah. as we got older and we got in the bands you know then we started you know going out to clubs uh, hanging out first our first club that we really really hung out at was Rodney Bingenheimer's English Disco an extremely famous club uh, on any level and um you know going in there and seeing like people like Led Zeppelin or the Sweet wow. or you know 
uh, Iggy, uh, Pop, you yeah. know, just being around all those people. I mean, you didn't talk to them. You just looked at them and you went, wow, I'm in the same room with them. And, you know, you know, I don't think there's too many people that would argue that, you know, being in the same room with Led Zeppelin is a bad thing. No, absolutely not. It's some bragging rights, you know, yeah. even if yeah. you're like the janitor and you're like emptying the ashtrays or something, you know, hey, I did that, you know. So that was all really good. Memories like that, just the stuff we didn't do musically. Because when we did the music, it was all very, very serious. And and we did work hard no matter what we did or who yeah. we were playing with. Yeah. Frankie Benali, uh, drummer, also shares a very important part in Quiet Riot history. Whilst Frankie didn't play with you um, during your time with Quiet Riot, you become very close with Frankie as well, right? I did. And we uh, had talked many, many times about me uh coming up on stage and doing a, a song with them yeah. and and i totally had planned on doing it sadly it just yeah. didn't happen we yeah. just were never in the same place at the same time for it to happen yeah. and and while i did play with quiet riot again my first time in the band in 46 years uh there was no frankie there was no kevin there was yeah. no rand there was yeah. no know anybody else it's the new guys and and that's cool hey at least it's called quiet riot you know yeah and very respectful for the legacy of the band as well and it's good to see Absolutely, they are yeah and particularly with rudy having you know been uh brought back into the fold you yeah. know that does give the band a lot of legitimacy and rudy's doing a great job with them yeah fantastic where did your musical journey take you after Quad Riot? Um, it took me in a place where you never think it would. Um, you know, all my life I dreamed of being a fireman and yeah. all through all through Quiet Riot, I, yeah. I had a day job and I worked in a flower shop. And one day a, a fireman came in, he was like a fire captain getting some flowers. And I said, oh, he's a fireman. I'm gonna talk to him. And I said, hey, how could I be a fireman? I thought it sounded like a pretty good job and stuff. And he says, he says, oh, well, it's pretty hard. You know, these days it's really hard unless you're a, a female, a midget or, you know, something else, uh, handicapped or whatever. You know, they had this new hiring policies where they didn't, you know, just hire capable people. Uh, affirmative action, they call it here in the States. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he says, well, what I'd recommend you do is go work ambulance for a few years and that'll uh, improve your chances of getting hired. And I said, okay. And, and I was still in a rock band. I wasn't planning on going out and working on an ambulance. In fact, I wasn't even old enough to do it when he told me that. But once I was, which was once I was out of the band, which is, uh, I was 20 years old. Uh, that's exactly what I did. I went to school yeah. for a few months and I came out, I had a job waiting for me. I went to work the day after I graduated and I worked ambulance for the next 10 years. Wow, you would have seen some amazing stories during that time as well? Yeah, it was uh, it was a different slice of life, of life than, you know, I had ever experienced, you know. Yeah. All I knew was rock and roll. Yeah. And now I'm dealing with car crashes, shootings, yeah. beatings, yeah. sick this, sick that. And, you know, and I, I, I didn't really like driving the ambulances. So I uh, insisted that I always work in the back. Every company I worked for, they always said, oh, you need to get your ambulance driver's license. And I'd say, yeah, 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 I'll get around to that. But I never got one. Because I just wanted to work in the back. I didn't want to drive the ambulance. I like I like working in the back. I like the medical end. Yeah, that's I that's a pretty, pretty well, right? For you know, you, you're 20 years old. You've just come out of a band. You've come out of a school, and as a 20 year old, that can be pretty harrowing. 
it was extremely harrowing and but it taught me a lot you yeah. know my my dad said probably the, the best thing about it and he said he said oh you're gonna go work ambulance huh and i said yeah and he said okay well you do that you'll know a real lot about life yeah and i said okay and i didn't really know what he meant until i went out there in the streets and yeah i learned it <laughs> i knew what he was talking about then yeah definitely definitely did that change your outlook outlook in life as well at that point oh absolutely yeah uh mostly not in the obvious ways that you'd think it would but you know uh i saw a lot of things that i thought were bad i saw a lot of things that made me realize whatever you do don't get sick in this country um you know everybody's still to this day uh here uh bitches about how crappy the medical system is and and it is it, yeah. it really is it needs a huge reform well you know it's nothing new it was back it was bad back then you know it, it was terrible then yeah wow rock and roll was still an important part of your life during this time though and in 85 uh, you played on Kel Rhodes, Kel Rhodes vocalist and, and Randy's older brother. He released an EP, Cheap Talking Romance, in 85. You guys re-recorded the Quiet Riot classic, Back to the Coast. Yeah, we did. And, um, yeah, I, I, I did everything on that album, actually. And, um, you know, of course, you know, I've always had a friendship with the Rhodes family. And yeah. certainly, you know, the passing of Randy and and everything that ensued after and all that has has made us all, you know, very close friends. Yeah. Uh, so he asked me to do that album, and I said, "Sure, man, yeah, I'll do it." And um, especially, you know, a song that was ours, and actually, "Back to the Coast" was originally his song. He wrote it. He wrote and Randy. It from him yeah and uh so um yeah that was great uh great experience since then kelly and i have you know we went to japan together we played over there we've played at numerous places around the country here and um and i'm still good friends with the, with the, the family but nice. You know, music is not my focus these days. I'm, no, I, I'm I, trying to get to that. I'm really I'm always interested. trying to get away from it, you know, because I don't want to be known as, oh, there's that guy that was in Quiet Riot because uh, Mate, that's what happens when I walk into a local bar here. I really want to talk about the next part of your career. Um, you're very artistic. And, you know, in the, in the 80s, you decided to, you know, change your vocational career and become a photographer uh, most notably down in the nevada area i believe where you supported local businesses may i say in their artwork and photography local businesses a very good way to put it yeah <laughs> my, my, to to my subject is entrepreneurs <laughs> yes indeed <laughs> indeed but you do it with an artistic flair Tell, tell me, how did you get into photography and, and particularly this special genre of photography? Actually, it was, from, it was from working ambulance because my driver, what, which was a girl that this particular day, uh, she brought a camera to work yeah. and was messing around with it. And I said, hey, this thing's really cool. I really like it. And she kind of taught me how to use it. This yeah. was back when you actually had to know how to use a camera. You had, use it, yeah. you had to set a film speed that went along with the film you were using. And so she had taught me all that and we were driving to a non-emergency call and I saw a cute girl sitting on a bus bench and I said, oh, oh, oh pull over, pull over. And so she pulled in and uh, into an alley and I jumped out with the camera and I ran up to the girl and I'm wearing my, you know, medic uniform, you know, so I don't look too creepy. And um, I asked her, I said, hey, you're really pretty. Uh, may I take a picture of you? And she said, sure. And so I took a picture of her and I said, 
cool, thanks. Can I get your phone number so I can, you know, show it to you when it's all done? And she said, okay. And she gave me her phone number. And I was like, wow. I mean, you know, if you're in a rock band, it's pretty easy to meet girls. But once you're out of a rock band, it's all over, folks. Girls, the girls are gone. So I thought that's a cool way to meet girls with the camera. Yeah. And so the uh, picture turned out good. I nice. did. I went out to dinner with her. I showed it to her. I made her a copy. And it didn't go much beyond that because I wasn't really trying. But, um, you know, it was really pleasant. And so I went right out and I bought a camera for a hundred bucks. And wow. then I, as I tell in my book, the most recent book, you know, I was working 96 hours a week, sometimes more, if you can even believe that, but we worked 48 hour shifts. So you work two of those a week and, you know, you had 72 hours of freedom. And they often tapped into that for some overtime. So you weren't around a lot. I didn't have time to be a photographer, but I kept the camera. Years and years later in the 90s, I had been divorced, uh, bad divorce, didn't have any confidence and said, you know, what can I do now? Uh, I need to, you know, meet some girls and have some fun and stuff like that. So out came the camera. And that turned into a career, which I never expected to happen. So let's let's talk about the career in a little bit more. And it's probably best captured in, in the book that you've mentioned. This year, re you released the book, Naked Vegas. Um, have you got a copy there that you can show us? It is right here. Fantastic. Tell us, what's, what's the inspiration about Naked Vegas? What's the story behind it? Because this really the captures... Is, your... You know what the story is? It's kind of an oddball story. It's the story of a man trying to keep himself in business. <laughs> because I, I didn't plan on being in business, so I had no business plan or anything. It just kept happening to me. Yeah. And I was working with modeling agencies and all that. I had dreams of being a, a much bigger and better photographer than I actually was or ended up being. But it turns out that the photography I did led me to a place that I'm, I'm very happy and satisfied with because it led me to where I wanted to be an artist. Yeah. And, um, and I never thought photography would do that for me, but it did. But it, it all started out with, with I was doing regular models um, for Las Vegas. I did, uh, I worked for the hotels, I did lots of billboards, I did lots of ads, uh, local actors, um, there were conventions, the models worked at the conventions, so they needed pictures. Eventually, uh, some escorts started calling me, yeah. and uh, the next thing I know, I was doing a different type of photography, and I was like, okay, well, we'll just roll with this, and that was uh the majority of my business uh, for quite some time. And it escalated from there. And one day the time came when I realized I was actually told that I should become uh, a nude photography, art photographer. And I went, all right, yeah. And so I took some models out and I tried to, um, do what I thought was art well I guess I did a pretty good job because it sold it did well everybody was happy I was happy and um, it's not even something you could even do now you couldn't even get away with doing it now no, what, no, what that's like, doing. No. because because the mod the, the girls have changed now they're all covered with tattoos they got rings in their nose they got all kinds of shit sticking out of their face it's, it's not the same thing. You know, my book, these girls don't have tattoos. They don't have shit sticking out of their face. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is more of an organic version of nude modeling. Yeah. You know, you look at it now, it's a whole different genre than, than this, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. These and are having 
you know, spoken with you. The the book is like very artful, very tasteful. Um, and it really captures your career that you just spoke about, you know, with the models and with the escorts as well. But the book also captures your love of Nevada as well. Absolutely. Nevada, tell me about Nevada. For, for an Australian who hasn't come over to America, why would Nevada be on my wish list to go see? <laughs> well, you might feel at home here. Kelly. <laughs> we don't have any kangaroos around here, or roos as you guys call them, I believe. But uh, we do have some coyotes and, uh, you know, a couple other little things like that. But, um, you know, if, depending upon what part of Nevada you're in, you, you could have to deal with a mountain lion. Uh, well, but how about deer? Do you guys have like deer, antelope, that kind of stuff? Uh, not not many. Ever have, have a couple of deers, um, more so over east, not, not where I live. Oh. Okay. He wants to know about what you like about Nevada. Yeah. What What do you like about Nevada? Well, to be honest, I imagine Nevada to be a lot like Australia, because any movies I see, like Mad Max or something, you know, it looks like a desolate area that that you know, large expanses of space, you know, remoteness, all these things. That's what I like about Nevada, and. Um, I feel very comfortable here. I'm comfortable in the desert. It just feels clean to me. It, it feels like the, the kind of place I should live in. I, yeah. I should also mention that off and on throughout my life, I had to live in Las Vegas because my parents were constantly moving between California, Las Vegas. One time they moved us to Alaska. Um, so wow. that's a massive so difference. I was very used to Probably. Las Vegas. Nice. But nice. It, it went further than that. Once I once I got the, the art bug in me, for lack of a better term, um, with the photography, once digital came mm -hmm. along, that changed everything in my world because suddenly, you know, you really didn't have to know what you were doing to be a photographer. You could be just about anybody and fix it in Photoshop or computers and stuff and, and all the things they use. My stuff in my book, that's not digital. Yeah. There's a there are a couple of digital pictures in there, but I don't go overboard with with manipulating them like they do now. Yeah. Everything I did was like black and white. I developed the film, I printed the pictures. Every piece of those pictures has my handprints all over it. Wow. So the book really yeah, captures the models. <laughs> Sorry? Not necessarily the models. <laughs> Kelly, let's let's have a look at that book again. Where can your fans find a copy? Well, uh, it's available on kellygarney.com. And that's for signed copy. Yep. Uh, it is a hardback. Nice quality nice. book. Nice. Uh, and it's also available on Amazon. You know, sadly, uh, when I uh, ship one overseas or something, the customs is so much. Even to Canada, you know, I wow. feel bad, but I have to pay it, you know. And, and these things yeah. actually cost me quite a bit of money. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, either one of those sources, anybody can contact me directly, Facebook, uh, any, any, any manner that they can, they can contact me. All, All that right. works. So the best place to get a, a signed copy is on your website and that's yeah. uh -huh. nakedvegas.com isn't it? Is yeah, that the... it's, it's, you know, I mean, this is the nature of what you're going to see. Yeah, yeah, very and, beautiful. And, and it's interesting because I would go to these places oh, oh, see these girls over here? Look at this. We used to have quite a bit of fun. We're shooting guns out there in the desert. Wow. Wow. They're naked. I'm not. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you know, the, the thing that, that got me to where I eventually landed uh, as far as art was I thought that going to all these ranch kind of places, old ranches out in the desert, um, you know, places that looked a lot like that, 
absolutely stunning. Look at that. Look at that scenery. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's it's just gorgeous. Yeah. And you will and, you will love Australia, mate, when you come over and visit. There's there's a lot of places. <laughs> well, to my nice. artistic eye, these places were beautiful. So you put a beautiful girl in it naked. Um, and that's art. That's my basic, you know, formula for art. Yeah. So I started with that. And I spent so much time at all these places, way, way, way out in the desert. I've been to old ranches. I've been to old mining sites, old mines, you, you name it. All kinds of places out in the middle of the desert, if you know how to find them. Yeah. And yeah. Um, they're very fascinating because life existed there at one time. Yeah. So when you walk around and you look on the ground, you find remnants of what life was like it's back true. then. That's right. And probably the best source of materials for me is is usually nearby any site is a trash site where they put all their garbage. That's where you find the good stuff. That's the treasure, mate. That is the absolute treasure. Yeah. Just repeating that. And, uh, it is available on Amazon. Uh, get a signed copy from nakedvegas.com or reach out to Kelly direct on Facebook. But it's your second book, mate. I, I, I did find a copy of your first book in 2013, Angels with Dirty Faces. Tell me yeah. about that. That book, um, you know, I, I've learned a lot about writing since I wrote that book. Yeah. That book wasn't even really my idea. It was a book I knew I would have to write someday. I knew that they were going to make me write a book because I had done so many interviews about Randy. I said, it's only a matter of time before somebody comes along and says, hey, you need to write a book. Yep. Well, that day came. So I wrote the book. They were supposed to be very helpful in the writing of this book, the people that came to me. And they were absolutely no help whatsoever. <laughs> And in fact, in, when I got the finished product of what they put together, it was it was absolute garbage. Yeah. It, it literally, I opened up, imagine this. You wrote a book. It's not even a small book. It's a big book. It's got 500 and something pages in it. You wrote all that, you know. And I get this big box from UPS with all my books in it. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I've been waiting for this day. My book. I wrote a book. I'm an author. Oh my gosh, it's so exciting. You know, so I open the box, I take out a book, and all the pages fall on the ground. And I'm like, what the hell? So I take out another book, all the pages fall out of that book. And I'm like, who printed this? <laughs> you know, so I had there. I mean, all told, you know, not in one box. There was actually a couple boxes. All told, there was 200 copies of that book. And every single one of them, uh, the pages fell out of. Wow. Because of the printer they went to. Of course, when I, you know, confronted them with, the fuck is up with these books? That yeah. freaking pages fall on the floor, you know. Um. They had a bunch of excuses, and I love to tell this story because this is such a great excuse. This is what I got told, why the pages fell out of my book. They said that a guy who worked there got mad at the owners, and he started a fire in the print shop, and then he quit, and that's what happened to my books. That's what I got told. So. Um, so anyway, so yeah, it just, we went back through the book. We had it reprinted through Amazon. That's worked out very well. Yeah. Um, and it did need some serious editing. So my first experience writing a book wasn't the greatest, but in the end, it's turned out pretty good. I'll let you know, mate, when my copy from Amazon arrives, if the pages fall out, you'll be getting an email from me. You know, I would like to know if that happens. <laughs> All right. I'll promise you that email. My I'd, like to, I'd like to tell you about something I was alluding to earlier about going yeah. to all these mining sites. You know, in the end, it wasn't such a one-off thing, which is taking the naked girls there. I still go out to these sites. 
because now I've refined my art to a completely different style that has to do with these remote places way out in the deserts. And what's that and style? The little objects that I would pick up off the ground uh, turned out they actually meant something. And um, so now I'm doing art with pieces I find out in the desert. Nice. So let me go get one. It's just right That'll over be here. That would be great. And uh, if your dog is still there, please yeah, go. Oh, yeah. You need to. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Lady, her dinner time, Lady, dinner time, and she's not the center of attention as she always is around here, as you can imagine. Okay. So say hi to your, your friends in Australia, Susan. Susan, this is. Uh, hi. All Kelly's, right. Kelly's I'm wife. doing Kelly, the tell right me what you're doing. Look at that. That's beautiful. Everything on here, the steel. Look at that. Everything is stuff I find in the desert. And and what do you do with this artwork? Is this available for fans as well? I do, I do art shows. I sell yeah. them online. Um, I've had very, very good success with this art. Nice. Uh, like nine years. It, it, it's very unusual. Uh, I've been doing it for, for quite a number of years. And uh, the, the components used, you know, to make this art, you, you can't go buy them. You have to right. go out in the desert and find them. <laughs> That's amazing. So your That's artwork, really where, where can I find details of your artwork as well for, for any fans out there that want to pick up a piece? Yeah, here's, oh. here's these are like just it's art. It's not, it's not a clock. No, no, look at it. That's uh, That's a wall piece right yeah yeah absolutely yeah normally the ones i was doing uh they were like two feet by three feet and uh and they sell you know for quite a bit and i needed something uh that was a little bit affordable for people that don't want to blow a couple grand on a piece of art so i started doing the clocks and and they're pretty affordable and they've been very popular i'm trying to get up a good stock of them so I can do an art show, but every time I make one and post it online, it gets bought. So I'm oh. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying the only thing <laughs> I'm complaining about is is I can't keep up with the, the demand of these uh, clocks. That's amazing, Kelly. This has been an absolute pleasure. You, you're obviously very artistic. Co-founder of Quiet Riot, an amazing photography career. You, you do some amazing artwork yourself. But I do have one final question because your career did move away somewhat from art at one point. You ran a haunted restaurant, is that right? I did, yes. Um, I moved up, and this is all from the art. This is the problem with the art. This is what it does to you. I uh, moved to a town called Pioch, Nevada, which is an old mining town, population 700. It's known as a living ghost town. Um there's not too much going on there. You don't have no supermarkets. Uh, you have a gas station. Uh, that's it. You don't have anything out there. And uh, I mean, the primary uh, enterprises in town was three bars. Yeah. That was the business of this town was bars. And it was a very, very touristy place. And I had a house right on the main street through town. And right across the street, there was an old building and I rented that. It was just a tin shack. Uh, it was fairly good size. And I only rented it because I needed a place to do my art. So yeah. it had wood burning stove in it. It was really old. It was actually formerly, uh, well, it was built in 1869 and it was uh, the town uh, blacksmith shop originally. And it had sat, uh, after that it became a fix it shop but it had sat unused since the 50s. Yep. No one had even really been in there. And so I took over that building just to do my art and uh, cleaned it up a little bit to get that done. Well, you know, it finally came to pass that I actually needed to figure out a way to make a living in this little ghost town. 
So I decided to turn it into a restaurant. My family had restaurants growing up, so I knew the restaurant business pretty well. And uh, and that's what happened. I turned it into a restaurant. It was a restaurant, art gallery, and a coffee house. And it was way cool. And it did very, very well. It was haunted. What well, What's the story behind it being haunted? Every every square inch of that town was haunted. It was so, it was very famously uh, an extremely wild town uh, in the Wild West days, and it, miners, uh, miners, and you know just people like that back back in the eighteen hundreds, uh, late eighteen hundreds, and uh, yeah, just a wild town. Um, but these days, you know, it, as I said, it's a living ghost town. So it's it's a fairly quiet place these days, but you know there are about 150 abandoned mines. You know if you wow. know how to get to them in yeah. the mountains around it. But it was yeah. a rough life. Snow. You have snow in Australia. You ever? We have snow ever? in Australia. We do. We do indeed. Not out where I live, but on the other side of Australia, yes, indeed, we have snow. Okay, I never knew that. I, in fact, I never. <laughs> even it thought never even crossed my mind till i talked to you yeah. my uh my home state of tasmania uh has a lot of snow so yeah really yeah it does, hmm. it does. um yeah did I've you never encounter i never the, survive in snow. sorry i never had to survive in snow until i got there i mean yeah my parents moved to alaska but we didn't go outside because I was so young and the snow was taller than us, so we were scared to go out there. Right, that's but, why I, I love living in the desert environment now. Uh, no snow over here. <laughs> yeah. Up there, though, I was shoveling snow. You wanted to get out of your house, you shoveled snow. You wanted to move your car, you shoveled snow. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, it was like that. And, and you didn't have, my restaurant didn't have real heat, so it was all about the wood-burning stove. And, wow. Always did you yourself? Fire. <laughs> did you yourself have an encounter with the other side during your time here? I did. I saw and heard things around there that, um, that I can't explain. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, we we would actually get a lot of people coming and visiting that town because of its haunted reputation. It was a hotel uh, right across the street from my restaurant, the Overland, that was reputed to be very, very haunted in one particular room. And numerous TV shows were done about it with these paranormal investigator types. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I've I've actually stayed there, and and no ghost came and woke me up, you know, but. Uh, you know, they, they kind of seemed to be around in my restaurant. Sometimes I saw things and I said, what the hell was that? And I really never knew and was never able to figure it out. Wow. But it was a trippy town. It was cool. It, it was different. You know, here I had grown up in the city my whole life. You know, Las Vegas is a big city. Yeah. You know, L.A. is kind of a big city, too. That's that's what I knew. I didn't know about this country living and this wood cutting stuff and shoveling snow. I didn't know anything about all that. Yeah. But I learned off quick. And you know what? I really loved it. It, it is. It is a special moment. Like even, you know, chopping wood. Fantastic experience, right? It feels yeah, great. It, it does. <laughs> Especially if a you have a log smoke. splitter yeah. with, a, with an engine on it. Yeah, right. <laughs> Kelly, it's been an absolute amazing chat. I really appreciate the time that you've given us today. Uh, me personally, I'm looking forward to my copy of Naked Vegas and Angels with Dirty Faces. So uh, really looking forward to both of those books. Well, Total Jock, I'm really happy that, that you reached out to me to do this, and I'm glad that we did. Uh, I love Australia. I hope that uh, I get millions of fans there from your show. <laughs> And uh, they demand that some bookstore bring me over there to do a book signing of pictures of naked American girls. You might want to drop a hint if you know somebody that owns a good bookstore, just in All case. Right. Let's get on to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kelly, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you, for your job. And look forward to chatting to you soon, mate. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.
Bye-bye.